the unknown experimental subjects of J. Marion Sims and Nathan Bozeman. With notable exceptions, most accounts of the Alabama fistula experiments of Dr. J. Marion Sims claim that of the approximately 10 enslaved women experimented on at Sims Downtown Montgomery Infirmary, or Negro Hospital, only three names are known, Anarka, Lucy, and Betsy. For the period of the initial experiments, from 1846 to 1849, this is correct. Between 1849 and 1858, however, the stories of an additional 19 women are known, and in most cases, their names are known as well. This series tells their stories. After five years of plantation medicine in Mount Meggs and Cubahatchee to the east, J. Marion Sims moved into downtown Montgomery in 1840 to focus on surgery. Original deeds indicate that Sims purchased lots 9 and 10 of Block 53 at the corner of Perry and Washington Streets. His home and office stood on this site. For several years, Sims built a practice among the Jewish, Irish, and well-to-do populations of the city. He also built a small Negro hospital in a portion of his backyard for enslaved persons living in Montgomery and for enslaved persons from plantations who were brought to town for surgeries on the eyes and feet and for orthopedic conditions. By 1845, Sims was searching for the kind of medical innovation that would make his name and make him wealthy. At the downtown infirmary, he performed experiments on enslaved men suffering from cancers of the face and jaw and on the babies of enslaved mothers in an attempt to cure infant lockjaw, later revealed to be a bacterial infection, tetanus. In the middle of 1845, Sims was called to the nearby Westcott Plantation to perform a forceps delivery on a young woman known as Anaka, or Anarka, who had been in labor for several days. Soon after, Anarka began to leak urine from her vagina. She had what is known as an obstetric fistula, an abnormal opening inside the body resulting from prolonged obstructed labor. Sims researched the condition, and though several cures of vesico-vaginal fistula had been recorded in recent medical history, he sent Anarka away as incurable. A month later, an enslaved woman known as Betsy was brought to Sims. She, too, had an obstetric fistula. A month after that, Lucy arrived with the same condition. Sims rejected them all. Lucy stayed the night in the Negro hospital. In the morning, Sims left home to attend to a white woman who had dislocated her uterus in a fall from a pony. In attempting to treat her, Sims put her into a position that suggested a possible cure for obstetric fistula. He rushed back to the Negro hospital to examine Lucy with an impromptu lever speculum, the bent handle of a pewter ladle. Could this be despite Sims' well-known distaste for investigating the organs of the female pelvis, the condition that brought him the fame he coveted? Sims gathered Anarka, Lucy, Betsy, and approximately seven other enslaved women suffering from the same condition and put them into his expanded Negro hospital, now outfitted with a second floor and a total of 16 beds. A series of experiments to cure obstetric fistula began in January 1846 and would continue until Sims claimed a cure on Anarka in May or June 1849. Sims was attempting to perfect a device called the clamp suture, but he achieved no success at all until he borrowed the innovation of another Alabama doctor, Henry Levert, the use of a silver wire as suture material. Several doctors had succeeded in curing obstetric fistula with wire suture material before Sims. At approximately the time of Anarka's cure, Sims took on an assistant, Nathan Bozeman. Immediately, Sims taught Bozeman his method, but notably, Bozeman never described a firsthand encounter with Anarka, Lucy, Betsy, or any of Sims' initial experimental subjects. What happened to them, and to Anarka in particular, is the story that is told in Say Anarka, a young woman, a devious surgeon, and the harrowing birth of modern women's health. In fact, Anarka was never truly cured and was experimented on further in Richmond, Virginia, and in New York City. 
Although Sims claimed after he cured Anarka in 1849 that he also cured Lucy, Betsy, and the others, the fistula experiments would continue until he published his method in an 1852 article. This article described his clamp suture, but did not offer detailed case histories, as was common at the time. At the end of his article, Sims indicated that he would one day provide detailed accounts of individual experiments. He never did. And many years later, Nathan Bozeman publicly criticized him for the omission. Sims and Bozeman worked together until 1853, when Sims moved to New York. Deeds indicate that Bozeman bought the downtown property at that time. After Sims left Alabama, Bozeman attempted to improve on Sims' clamp suture with his own button suture. Bozeman initially heaped praise on Sims, as many others did. But within a few years, he became an active critic of Sims' methods and his false claims of success. Bozeman himself would claim to have cured many of the enslaved women that Sims had abandoned or mutilated. Most of the accounts in this series come from Nathan Bozeman's highly critical articles of Sims. In examining the accounts of the women who were experimented on here, it's important to remember several things. First, neither Sims nor Bozeman were acting out of altruistic motive. The women they experimented on could not provide consent, and though some of them may have been cured, the cure meant only that they would be returned to their plantations to be forced to breed more enslaved persons, to perform exhausting labor, and to be raped by overseers and by their enslavers. Second, neither Sims' clamp suture nor Bozeman's button suture was the cure to obstetric fistula. Sims published his method in 1852. It was completely abandoned by 1856. In that year, Sims performed seven experiments on white women in New York, using Bozeman's method to demonstrate its shortcomings. In short, both Nathan Bozeman and J. Marion Sims used the bodies of enslaved women to pursue wealth and fame. Although it is tempting to see Bozeman as heroic compared to Sims, he was just as ambitious, and he was called the greatest gynecologist in the world before Sims was called the father of gynecology. What is displayed in this series is not the story of a hero and a villain. It is the story of two ambitious men using the bodies of enslaved women to conduct a petty feud. Last, the accounts presented here are obviously the white narrative. The text summarizing each woman's story is a summary of the accounts of white surgeons who were acting on self-serving motives. These accounts are the raw sources the only accounts we have for what these women suffered. It goes without saying that the real truth of their lives must be inferred from these texts. J.C. Hallman